Okay, you are live. Thank you. Great. Do you want me to start? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, great. First of all, hello everyone. I am here in Sharon Stead today. She is um, not available. So I will be doing the meeting for with you. So I'm gonna go through her script. So it simply reads, good afternoon and welcome to the four o'clock meeting of the September the 27th, 2021 Park Advisory Committee meeting in the East Bay Regional Park District. Chair Ricard, would you like me to take the roll? Yes, uh, please call the roll and ask committee members to state their name, appointing authority and hometown when they uh, answer you. Okay, you heard the direction of the chair to state your name, appointing authority. And I'm going to start with Vice Chair Obringer. Good afternoon, everyone. Harlan Obringer, appointing authority is the Contra Costa Mayor's Conference and Concord is my home city. Thank you. Marie Arce. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marie Arce. Appointing authority is Colin Coffey and my hometown is Antioch. Linda Best. Hi, uh, Linda Best, uh, appointed by Director Beverly Lane and I live in Alamo. Um, Annie Burke. I'm Annie Burke. I'm appointed by the Alameda County Board of Supervisors, and I live in Berkeley. Andrew Carey. I see you, Mr. Carey. We see you, but we can't hear you. Yeah, you're on mute, sir. Oh, now you're, there we go. Try it again. It's not working. Now you muted yourself again. We'll come back to you. Now he's there. Yeah, I see him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Susie Claxton. I know I saw you. Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm here. Every time I tried to click on unmute, it like gave me this menu. <laughs> okay. Susie Claxton appointing Authority is Director Waspy, and my hometown is Fremont. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Corkin? Uh, I'm present. Uh, Sharon Corkin, uh, appointed by the Alameda Labor Council. Irene Dieter? Hi, I'm Irene Dieter, and I live in Alameda and was appointed by Director Corbett. Mich uh, Michael Gregory? <laughs> Hi, Yolanda. Michael Gregory, okay. also appointed by Director Corbett. I live in San Leandro. Thank you. Adele Ho. Hi, I'm Adela Ho, appointed by Director Elizabeth Eccles, and I live in West Contra Costa County. Rochelle Mason. Hi, I'm Rochelle Mason. I was appointed <laughs> by uh, the Alameda County, <clears throat> excuse me, Alameda County Mayor's Conference, and I live in Albany. Thank you. Dev Mahadevan. I know I messed your name up. I apologize. You're on mute, sir. Well, I got muted. Sorry. Uh, hi, Dev Mahadevan. I was appointed by Director Waspi and I live in uh, Castro Valley. Thank you. Um, Roland, I don't see Roland yet. Neil Tsitsui. Hi, I'm Neil Tsutsui. I live in El Cerrito, and I'm appointed by the Contra Costa Board of Supervisors. Okay. This is Roland. Can you not hear me? Oh, there you go. I don't. I don't see you. Okay, Roland. Yeah, where you? I don't know what's. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with my camera right now, but I'm here, and I okay. am appointed by Alameda County uh, Special Districts Association. Okay, great. I have a note that Elisa Robinson is absent today. Did I miss anyone? Yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Igor. Igor Skaradoff. Hi, uh, I'm Igor Skaradoff. Uh, I'm representing the Contra Costa Special Districts Association. And my hometown is Shanghai, China, but I presently live in Martinez. <laughs> okay. Uh, Andrew, you're back. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yay. I had to switch computers. Uh, my name is Andrew Carey. 
I live in Newark and I was appointed by Ann Weisskamp. Thank you. Oh, hi, James, your turn. Hi, James Chang. Uh, I, I am from Berkeley, California. I am appointed by Director Elizabeth Eccles and my hometown is Simi Valley, California. Thank you. Fabulous. And then finally, of course, Chair Ricard. Hi, Rick Rickard, appointed by President Rosario and I live in Oakland. Thank you very much for the introductions. Uh, can you give us the rundown on the other staff members present, please, Yolanda? Yes, sir. Eric Fuller, Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs. I don't see you, but I'm sure you're here. Um, Lance I'm Breed, here. yes, there you go. Lance Breed, are you here for um, Chief Chiaboro? I am here, Yolanda, and uh, Chief Chiaboro should be joining us as well. Okay, cool. Um, Carol Johnson, AGM Carol Johnson. I am here. There you go. Hello, hi everybody. Hi, um, Kevin Damstra, Supervising Naturalist. Hello. Hello. Um, and then I saw Flora. Flora, I can't pronounce your last name, sorry. That's okay, I'll answer to most variations of it. Flora <laughs> Chantosh, Legislative Assistant. Good to meet everyone. Good to meet you. And then we have Director Rosario and Director Eccles. Great. And, um, and, yes, then hi. Course, <laughs> and then of course, I wanna um, say Sydney Erickson is here from Prime Gov. She's doing all the background stuff. And of course, as always, uh, Matthew James is uh, Mr. Support Person of the Year. So I think that's all that I have. Yolanda. Uh oh, missed oh, you. That I didn't see so right. Christina, not on purpose, uh, Christina Kelchner, AGM. Right, AGM of Acquisition <laughs> Stewardship and Development and Brian Holt, Chief of Planning will be joining us a little later as well. Okay, fantastic. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Today's committee meeting is held in accordance with Governor Newsom's executive order allowing for members to participate in standing committee meetings remotely. We are also providing live audio streaming and have provided the public the opportunity to email or call in prior to the meeting for public comment. This information can be found on the agenda on the district website, edparks.org. Do any committee members have any questions about the meeting procedures? If not, we will begin the agenda. Uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the meeting of July 26th, 2021. Do I hear a motion for approval? So I move. still move. Oh, whoops. Uh, move approval, but somebody right. get over it. Uh, and I'll second. Right. I'll second that motion. Okay. De uh, moved by Dev, uh, seconded by Carlin. Is there any discussion? Uh, Hi. Su Susie. Yeah. Um, I noticed on those minutes that. Um, I'm sorry for getting your first name, Sisui. Both um, abstained from voting on the July 26, but also moved to approve the minutes. I I didn't understand that. <laughs> well, I, think, I believe he abstained because he was not there, but he still can move for approval. As oh, okay. Member, That's right. I believe. Yeah. Okay, I thought yeah, moving so I, for approval was kind of like voting. Yes. <laughs> I. Um, thought, Okay. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Madam Secretary, would you call the roll? Yes, uh, Chair Ricard. Vice Chair Obringer? Yes. Marie Arce? Yes. Linda Best? Yes. Annie Burke? Yes. Andrew Carey? Yes. James Chain? Yes. Kathleen Claxton? Yes. Sharon Corkin? I abstain. Irene Dieter? Yes. Michael Gregory? Abstain. Adele Ho? Yes. Michelle Lacey? She's not here. Dev Mahadevan? Yes. Yes. Rochelle Mason? Yes. Olivia Sanwong? Oh, she's not here. 
Igor Skaridov? Yes. Neil Tetsui? Yes. Roland Williams? Yes. And Chair Ricard? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I believe at this point, we'll move on to hear from uh, Elizabeth Eccles, the director from Ward 1. Uh, director Eccles, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. And I just want to confirm, uh, is it Flora or Sharon who's going to be driving the slides? I just wanted to double check. I will drive them for you, actually. This is Carol. Carol? Flora will be Flora. Oh, Flora, did you did she have them? I didn't know she did have them. Oh, I don't I don't know. Okay. Just want to make sure them? that someone's got them. Well, here, here we go. Perfect. Um let's see. How do we um how do I display. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, there you go, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you um, for all your help. Um, so first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here today. It's great to see all of you. It's I think I've been almost a year since I've seen most of you. So um, it's I'm glad to be back. And, and I have a fairly lengthy presentation, but I'm gonna go through it quickly because I can see that you've got a pretty full agenda. Um, but if there are any questions at the end, feel free, we can take a few minutes for questions. If you have an urgent question, just you, you might just need to shout it out because it's hard to see everybody with the, with the slides up. So um, anyway, with that, I will, I will get going. Uh, so yeah, so this slide. So as you as you all know, we have 75 incredible regional parks and um, and I'm so happy to have this opportunity to be on the board to help protect, preserve, and expand our parkland and and also to work towards truly equitable access to parks and recreational opportunity. And of course, another thing that I'll be touching on in, in this presentation today is, is combating the impacts of climate change, which is, of course, in addition to wildfire and sea level rise, we now are just experiencing very extreme impacts of the drought on our, on our trees. And you're probably aware of that, but I'll say a few words about, about that as well. So I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, I, I'm very fortunate in Ward 1 to have what I consider yeah. some of the very best parks in the whole district, although all of them are wonderful. I'm just a little biased. So I have, as you can see, Brooks Island, Kennedy Grove, McLaughlin East Shore, Miller Knox, Point Isabel, Point Pinole, Sobrante Ridge, Tilden, and uh, Wildcat Canyon. Okay, next slide. And so quickly, uh, these are the areas that, that I'm gonna cover. Um, in terms of what's new and going to give a little bit of up an update of what's happening in Ward 1. And you can, I won't read them all out here because um, I'm going to be going through them pretty quickly one by one, but that's basically, basically the agenda there. So as, as you know, uh, this was actually last summer, um, summer of 2020, that we opened the Albany Beach and Bay Trail extension. And uh, this has just been incredibly uh, popular. We've seen the amount of trail usage triple based on what the usage a few years back. And um, of course, this, this by closing this one mile gap in the San Francisco Bay Trail, we're able to create 18 miles of continuous Bay Trail from Oakland to Richmond. And we are also able to expand the beach and add um, additional walking trails, picnic tables, parking, new bathrooms, water fountains, et cetera. And um, this, this has really been, uh, I was and is a, a culmination of you know, 20 years and more of 
collaboration with local community leaders and uh, advocates. And we're, I, I was just so happy to see this come to fruition. And I want to particularly acknowledge uh, Albany City Council member who's in our midst here um, with her efforts over the year, both in terms of the Albany Beach restoration and, and Bay Trail extension, but also her ongoing work at, at Albany Beach. I mean, she just does an incredible amount of, of, of work to um, keep it clean and to keep it safe and to make sure that all everybody's interests are being taken care of there at Albany Beach. So really, really appreciate that. Um, so of course, if you haven't yet been down here to Albany Beach um, and seen the new Bay Trail extension, you got to check it out. It's it's incredible, um, just incredible views and really great walking. You can see um, some of the the views and and the design that was that was needed to create this um, Bay Trail extension. Okay, we can go to the next slide. I think that's the same one. So, oh, sorry, wait, I'm not where you are. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Here we are. Okay. Um, yeah, this, uh, this is another exciting project not far from Albany Beach. This is the, the Gilman Street over over crossing crossing over um 80 and it's it's really um very exciting because what it will do is provide a safe crossing over the i-80 freeway from west berkeley to mclaughlin Easter park and so this will allow folks on on bikes and or walking to to get across and to enjoy that beautiful um that beautiful shoreline and to get onto the bay trail and and of course, as we just saw, go all the way to Richmond or to Emeryville if they wanted, or Oakland rather, if they wanted to go in that direction. Um, so this was, a, this was a project that was managed by Caltrans and funded by a, a number, well, both Measure BB and federal and state funding. And we did a, a virtual uh, opening of this in May, which was, I participated in that, it was a lot of fun. Okay, so, okay, it looks like, okay, I think Carol's one, one slide ahead of me, but, but that's okay. I think we'll just go ahead to that. I'll go ahead to where Carol is. So Carol, you can go ahead and, and play that. It's an animation of what it's gonna be like when this is completed. So you should be able to click on, if you can, can you, can you click on your, Oh, I don't see an arrow on yours. You should be, let me try, my, oh no, mine's not gonna connect. <laughs> okay, well, Carol, you should have a, you should be able to click on that and actually bring up the animation. I know, I'm trying to, and I'm sorry that it is not, there is a, there's a, but it's just forwarding the next slide. Oh, okay. Well, my that's apologies. all right. So, so I, I'm, I can just, you, you guys can use your imagination and, it's it, basically what this shows is people going up and walking over the, what the new overcrossing is going to look like. Um, and I'm happy to, to send it to, I'm happy to send the link to anybody who's interested, but it's, 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 it's going to be great. It's, uh, it's going to improve access from, as I said, from West Berkeley and give people an opportunity to get over on that gorgeous shoreline without using a car. So I'm very excited about that. Um, okay, we can go ahead to the um, Brickyard Cove public access. So, so here, this is phase one of this project is going to be opening soon, and that's going to include um, better shoreline access plus visitor improvements and habitat restoration. And it will also include a staging area with 47 parking spots, restrooms, water fountains, picnic tables, et cetera. And um, we're gonna be excited to, to see this part of the shoreline, which, which uh, now is, is not, I mean, it, I, you know, I still go down there, but it's not nearly as, attra as attractive as it will be once, once this um, new Brickyard Cove public access phase one and phase two complete. And phase two, will include additional parking and amenities and also a new facility for the Seabreeze Deli. Okay, 
So another hot topic in my district is a uh, is a Jewel Lake, and Jewel Lake, as many of you know, is just a you know an incredible. It's an incredible treasure to people who've who've gone there growing up, who take their kids and grandkids there, and people who enjoy watching the birds and other wildlife. And but but what has happened um, with you know so much runoff from from the neighborhoods going into Wildcat Canyon Creek and and building up sediment, um, it's it's it fills up and it has to be either dredged regularly or um, we need to have some other kind of solution or a combination. And so what, um, what well, Christina's here and, and her team, Lisa Gorgian and others have done a wonderful job of, of working with a consultant to, to look at different proposals for, for what we can do longer term and how we can, certainly one of my goals is to keep uh, an open body of water there, but how can we do that in a way that doesn't impede fish that want to get upstream and and how we can maximize the flow so that there's not as much sediment build up because it's it's extremely expensive now to it gets more expensive all the time to try to dredge lakes and and ponds and other things um, but this is uh, something that's that is it, it is very important to the community and there will be a public workshop via Zoom on October 20th from 6.30 to 8. So feel free to, to join in if you wanna hear all about it. Okay, so moving on to Point Malate. Um, this is the Point Malate Bay Trail Extension. And this is a joint partnership between us and the city of Richmond. We're developing a 2.5 mile extension of the San Francisco Bay Trail out at Point Malate. Uh, the district has the lead on, on designing and permitting and construction. And what's exciting, there's a lot of things exciting about this, but one of them is that it will connect with the bicycle and pedestrian path from the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. Um, and it'll also just be a great opportunity for people to to really get more access out there to Point Malate and to use that trail and hopefully in the future more than just a trail out there. Um, but this was this was we're taking responsibility for uh, one point one and a quarter mile and then uh, Richmond is doing the other one and a quarter mile um, and that's. Um, that will I suppose Christina can tell you more about it, but but um, that hopefully that work will get underway fairly soon. Oh well, and the, the construction is expected to begin be, begin next year. Um, okay, so yeah, so I think so. This just shows. Oh wait, are we already do we skip over the. Carol, I'm sorry, did, did, you, did you already show the, yeah, okay, there we go. So you can see just more specifically on this slide where, um, you know, where what we're gonna be filling in. And you can see that we have that first one and a quarter miles and then Richmond has the, the second. And um, so it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be great. Um, okay, next point Pinole to Wilson Point. So this is, a, this is also a, a, a great project because there's this, there's a small gap, um, the a 0.9 mile gap, but once we can fill it, it's gonna be a continuous six mile segment from, from basically um, Bay Trail to um, Rodeo, in Rodeo to Point Pinole. And um, it's a very challenging project because there's very steep topography and we need to avoid or relocate utilities and establish local access and design the boardwalks and bridges over wetlands and provide mitigation. But all of that, um, Christina and her team are very capably uh, working on and, and, and addressing. And then here in this next slide, you can see, um, you can see actually some of the obstacles, which is you've got these railroad tracks and then you've got these very pristine um, 
habitat areas that we need to work around to make sure that they continue to be safe and accessible for, um, for the wildlife out there. Okay, so the, the estimated cost of this project is about 5.2 million um, and funding is still needed, um, but we're, I mean, at least I'm cautiously optimistic about getting it. Um, okay, so we can move on to the, to the tree, the tree die off. Now this is, this, I'm sure you've heard a lot about this already, but this is, this is so important. I mean, we have 1500 acres of dead and dying trees in the, in the park and believe that it's caused by extreme drought and the change, which is caused by the changing climate. Um, fortunately, Chief T um, Chief Tiley was really got right out there and um, she was very proactive about identifying the issues and trying to figure out what was wrong. And we've been successful in getting money from the state, state budget, $10 million for dead tree removal for our parks. Um, of course, this is a huge wildfire safety concern because the, a, a dead standing tree is about the worst thing you can have. It burns hotter and faster and can cast embers far ahead of the original fire and, and create new dangerous fires. So this is something that we're working very hard on and also had some a, a number of recent meetings. We've been meeting with our, you know assembly members and supervisors and recently had a meeting with the deputy director of the natural California State Natural Resources. And so just really raising attention to this issue. It's not just us, it's it's really all, all across the state. So it's it's a very concerning situation. Okay. And of course we also have our, our annual fuel reduction work that we do every year. Um, every year our crews go out there and reduce thousands of acres literally of brush and hazardous trees to maintain the, the parks, make them healthier and safer. And, and when there is a fire within the East Bay Regional Parks, we have our own 50 member strong professional fire department. We also have mutual aid agreements with several partnering agencies. Um, and since 2019, we've tripled the size of our year round fuels reduction crew members. And it's, which is just incredibly important. And let's see, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Um, one of the things, well, of course, here you see some of our favorite fuel reduction workers, the goats, everybody loves the goats. Um, but the other thing that I did want to mention that we also support other agencies around the state when they respond to fires. In fact, we had um, our OES engine and crew spent over 50 days um, out there fighting the Dixie fire, which is finally starting to get under control. Um, and then we also now have folks out there fighting the, the Fawn fire in Shasta County. Okay. And then I just wanted to really give a shout out to everyone who went out and helped clean up on uh, <clears throat> earlier this month. And um, I was particularly happy to have 78 volunteers out there at Point Isabel and helping to, to clean. Of course, we, we folks were on nine miles of shoreline across six regional parks and um, we had 600 participants who helped remove 4,030 4, pounds of garbage and 175 pounds of recycling. So um, really appreciate all of our volunteers who came out. And so with that, just gonna see if there's anyone who had any questions or um, wanted additional information. Any questions for Director Eccles? <laughs> Deb, did you have your hand up? I... Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, I, I think the Point Malati Trail director said that uh, there's another mile or so that's Richmond. Is that the city of Richmond that's going to do that piece? 
Yeah, so we're we we are working. We're partnering with the city of Richmond. So it's two and a half miles all together, and we have one and a quarter, and they have one and a quarter. But we have jointly gone out for some grants, and we're also we're taking the lead on the design and construction. But then they will they will be doing their part, and we're going to be doing our part. We'll be getting more information on that on October sixteenth as well when we go out and visit Point Malate. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Igor, you have a question. I do. Uh, I was wondering, with all this uh, attempt to reduce the fuel, is there any opportunity to find useful uh, applications for the wood that's taken out? Uh, yes, we we are we are looking into that. Um, in fact, I don't know. Dee, do you want to? You might have more information on that than I do at this point. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah, in our meeting with uh, Jessica Morse, the uh, deputy chief. Uh, natural resources. Uh, she indicated there was a, a, a money set aside for innovation for uh, for uh, product wood innovation for uses of wood. And one of those innovations that she mentioned was uh, new standards for the use of laminated wood for high rises. And so now you can use laminated wood, which is they say is the strongest steel and probably more resilient. And then you can they can use laminated wood to uh, uh, to uh, to build up to about, I think, 11 stories. And so they're also looking into um, more port, we specifically asked the question about uh, portable uh, uh, biogenerators, because uh, we, we had specifically asked for a couple of grants to try out a biogenerator for Point Pinole and Anthony Chabot to get rid of some of the wood debris. And as she said, that was definitely back on the table. Um, so there's lots and lots of uh, money that's going into the um, marketing portion of, of uh, how they can use this wood. So uh, it was very, very encouraging to hear her talk. She is so good. Uh, and she knows she knows the subject from the, from the top to the bottom. She's amazing. Great. Thank that's you. Good to hear. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Neil, you have a question. Yes, uh, great. Thank you for that presentation. It's great to see all the activity going on in Ward One. Um, Thank you. you know, with everything going on in the background, you know the fires and climate change, plus all the normal things, it's, it's a, a big load. Um, so I was recently asked some questions about this, and I thought maybe I would just pass them on to you. Um, do you know if there is a role for the, maybe the board has spoken about this amongst yourselves, but you know if there's a role for the regional parks, for the park district in the governor's 30 by 30 um, proposal to protect 30% of wildlands by 2030? Has, has there been discussion of the park district lands being included in that? Yeah, so, um, you know, certainly when we, we talk amongst ourselves about 30 by 30, we think that that should help us in terms of of preserving our land and, and expanding and expanding the parkland, at least that's how I think about it. Um, I don't know if, if either Eric or Dee wants to comment on whether there's been specific conversations with, with the governor's office on that, because I'm not aware that there have been. Yeah, we have um, Eric Fieler, Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs. <clears throat> we have been in contact with our delegation uh, and also the resources agency about mm -hmm. securing some funding to help uh, implement 30 by 30, which would be sort of cons conservation and restoration of, of existing property. Um, I know we also, and I, saw, I thought I saw Christina pop on, but I know we're also involved with Together Bay Area um, and a Annie's group um, on 30 by 30 from a, from a regional standpoint and weighing in with uh, rulemaking and, and working with the resources department as well. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, wanted to just share a delightful experience uh, just Saturday, since we have a, a couple of trustees on the call, uh, and, and both of these rides occurred in, in your, your districts. So last Saturday, Bike East Bay hosted a, a guided ride from the Richmond BART station out to Point Pinole and back. And my gosh, I've, I've watched the Dotson family uh, marsh take off for years. I never got to lay eyes on it. So um, I want to just share this collaboration, corroboration with Bike East Bay 
is brilliant uh, in terms of beautiful days getting people out on bikes. The other ride was uh, the uh, Fruitville Station out to uh, Oyster Bay in San Leandro. Mm -hmm. Um, so twofold, uh, the rides are guided, so you don't have to think <laughs> it's done at a recreational pace. So it's not a race. And I, I think on the first ride, which was the Oyster Bay one, there was going to be a East Bay parks naturalist or interpreter provided for the ride. Uh, it didn't happen. I, I, I stepped up, so don't worry. We were covered, <laughs> but the point is. This is an amazing corroboration between these two organizations that just brings joy and just pure delight. Uh, to, it's free. Uh, it's just something I hope I hope we can encourage more of these kind of co-op corroborations with Bike East Bay. It's it's a plug for Bike East Bay, but their footprint is absolutely perfect, perfectly uh, uh, overlapped with the East Bay Parks footprint. So there's many, many, many more opportunities here. So that's it. Just, just wanted Great. to share. Thank that. you. Thank you. Uh, Bike East Bay was actually very involved in in the bike pedestrian bridge over at the I eighty uh, over I eighty at Gilman, but they but they do great things. They're doing great stuff all around the district. Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, let's do one more question so we can move on. Uh, Rochelle, you have a question. Uh, yeah. You mentioned a meeting about Jewel Lake, and I missed the detail on that. Can you repeat? Uh, the, when that will be held? Is that a Zoom meeting we can uh, plug into? Yes, it is. It's, um, and I believe now, I don't have the date in front of me. I think it's the 20th of October. It's on the, if you go to the main page of the, of the website, it's, it's up there, but yes, it's a Zoom that you can plug into. Actually, you know what? I can just look quick. Wait, you know, I can just pull it up in my notes real quick. I think it was the it's, it's October 20th, I recall. It is the 20th. Okay. All oh, right. October. Okay. Yeah, October 20th. Got it. Thank um, you. Yeah, and it's a Zoom call and we can, you know, we can send out, we can send out the link to everybody, make it easy for, for you all. Oh, we've got it in the chat from Flora. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Director Eccles, for your input. And, and uh, President Rosario, unless you've already left us. Nice to have both of you with us today. Uh, Carol Johnson, I believe you are doing the foundation report today. I will be very brief. Yes, thank you. Um, well, uh, this last weekend, the foundation and the board and the, the uh, park district came together to celebrate Tilden Regional Park's 85th anniversary. I hope some of you had a chance to join us at that look, at that uh, event held last Saturday. The foundation had a wishing tree that was and will become part of the ongoing dialogue between the community and the district on what the community may be interested in seeing at the uh, soon to be um, redone environmental education center. As you know, the foundation has agreed to um, undertake a capital campaign um, in excess of $20 million to um, create with the park district, obviously a more contemporary uh, facility. And so this was our very first time with a very soft announcement um, to share with the public who was there. And so there's a wishing tree now in the um, main lobby area of the current EEC for people to share their ideas about what they'd like to see. So we're looking forward to getting that feedback. And of course, the district will start its process um, very soon. They're currently looking for an architect at this point. So I think that's the biggest part of the news from the foundation at this time. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions for Carol? Rochelle? Yeah, are, will there, are there naming opportunities associated with the Tilden Nature Center for philanthropists? Um, there, there will be discussion uh, between our board, the foundation's board and the elected board to determine what um, appropriate naming uh, recognition uh, everybody is comfortable with. So there will 
at some point be a discussion in that regard. Um, but right now there's no policy or no specific uh, protocol for that. But I'm anticipating lots of questions from philanthropists who are perhaps interested and eager. Thanks for Thank the question. You. Great. All right. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have any public comments today? Uh, Chair Ricard, <clears throat> excuse me, we do not have any public comments of people that have called in. However, I do see Mr. Abreu on the line. So Kelly, I don't know if you had a comment on any item, any or yeah. a public comment. Um, uh, yes. Uh, or is I it do, on I wrote or is it on an agenda uh, item? Kelly, is it no, on an public agenda comments item? Are not, okay. not, items not on the agenda. I, I wrote okay. to uh, Ms. Clay. Um, the, the, um, uh, these, uh, just a few updates on, uh, from Fremont and Sinal. Uh, City Council of Fremont has been taking uh, actions, uh, 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 you know, openly and publicly uh, votes uh, regarding Mission Peak. Last December, they voted a referral asking staff to come back with a report on the status of negotiations with the park district regarding renewal of the lease. Um, that was last December, that's uh, nine and a half months ago, uh, 10 months ago. And, uh, you know, uh, it has, nothing has come of it yet. Uh, no, nothing has come back to the council yet. So that tells you how difficult it is uh, to handle this uh, for them. Um, then, uh, but, but in July they voted to raise the ra the char prices of parking tickets in the city, uh, which sounds like a very uh, you know routine item, they raised most of the parking tickets up to uh, nineteen percent, up to seventy five dollars. Uh, one special category of parking ticket is the special uh, crime, the special crime of parking at Mission Peak uh, near Mission Peak. Very, it has its own uh, special type of uh, of uh, criminal offense number. And it doesn't charge $75, it charges $82. That's a 30% increase. There was no reason given for why they need to charge uh, Mission Peak visitors more than just regular uh, you know, uh, parking at a red zone or whatever. Uh, we're still waiting on that. And it's uh, very irksome, very, very irksome and bothersome to have this kind of disparity, inequity and unfairness in the parking tickets fines. Um, and then over at, uh, at Sinol, uh, the, um, uh, there's a, a thing called the Tyler Ranch Staging Area. Park District's been working on it for 10 years. And uh, the people of Sinol turned out in uh, force. Uh, they're very upset with this because it's got 70 parking spaces. It's got a road, a two-lane road, a very short two-lane road, half a mile from the, from the center of town. And uh, they're, they're concerned that these parking spaces might overload the road. They're concerned about uh, crime. They're concerned about everything you can imagine. And these kind of concerns are very, very uh, routine because whenever the park district does these things, the, um, the people, it's, all, it's such a political issue. Uh, much more, the park district has a much more difficult time developing facilities than a private developer does building dams and lakes and beaches and, uh, and, and banquet halls. Um, it's uh, incredibly much more difficult. And the Park District has to do environmental reporting that a lot of uh, uh, private uh, developers tend to skip. So um, yeah, this is uh, gonna be a problem and uh, it's really uh, not, not something that the, that's uh, being uh, shared equitably among the planning and legal system. It's being, uh, the burden is being uh, uh, placed on the park district. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Those are all the comments, Chair Ricard. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we'll move on to the presentations now. I do want to make a comment before we move into the presentations. Uh, if you look at our work plan, there are items on the work plan that were scheduled for this month that are not on the agenda. Uh, those have not gone away entirely, but uh, due to workload and scheduling issues, staff is not ready to present them yet. So they're still on our work plan, but they're not on the agenda for today. If you have questions about why that's the case, um, 
But the first item on our agenda is the naming proposal to honor former director Doug Seiden. And I believe that uh, Eric Feeler and Carol Johnson are making a presentation. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Rickards. I will start and I will pass along to my colleague, Eric, and we will try to do this uh, quickly, but with appropriate justice for this amazing human being. Um, the purpose for this discussion today is to provide the PAC um, an update that the board of directors would like to name a um, particular amenity in the, in the parks um, to honor former director, Reverend Doug Seiden. And um, this has been an ongoing discussion and um, Mr. Seiden has uh, actually been consulted and has consented. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about today is to inform this group and to answer any questions you may have and to review Doug's contributions to the district, um, which are many. Um, next slide. So in your packet, you have a staff report that Eric and I prepared that really goes into depth about um, uh, former director Seiden's background uh, in, in the environmental and social justice. It is extensive, um, starting as a young minister in the 60s, supporting in, in, and developing interracial a church that supported fair housing. He marched with uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and worked side by side with Cesar Chavez. And I'm certain many, many other important icons in the civil rights movement um, did Doug um, speak and, and uh, support over the years. Um, he was a founding board member of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center in Oakland, uh, along with uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. I now sit on that board succeeding Doug on, on the, the board of directors and it is a phenomenal organization that works very, very fervently to advance um, young um, uh, individuals from this community um, to, to educate on economic uh, and um, civil uh, engagement types of uh, curriculum and it's phenomenal. I can honestly say that because I've been involved with it. And then finally, um, Doug has obviously been a very successful uh, rep representative of the American Baptist Church is, is Association. And uh, for 20 plus years, he created an environmental education program that um, worked specifically with children and families to um, communicate and to provide actual tan, uh, on, on site tangible um, recreational uh, amenities that uh, got these individuals involved in nature. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons, as he's told me, that he decided to run for the board seat, uh, which was for Ward 4 in um, Alameda for the East Bay Regional Park District. Next slide. Doug and, and EBRPD has, have gone very far back. Many of you were probably at his retirement, which was in 2016. Seems like it was just last year. Doug has been very active for more than the 24 years he was actually elected and served five terms um, in some of the greatest years of growth for the Park District. Here on the left, you can see him um, when, we, when we dedicated uh, or made a groundbreaking of a new trail that will um, grace the uh, um, Alameda Point area. Um, it was, as you can see, it was all fenced off with barbed wire. And so one of the things Doug really wanted to do, to do is he wanted to use some bolt cutters, which he did that day, and actually cut through the fence and make it uh, almost immediately accessible. Of course, we had some safety issues that we had to deal with, but that was Doug making sure that the public was gonna have access. Um, Doug has been uh, committed to youth over the years, uh, certainly in his private life, but especially in his public life um, and really personifies um, uh, the, the connection and the commitment to, um, to youth development. He was very much an advocate with the Regional Parks Foundation as well. And during his tenure, he participated in developing, was one of the visionaries uh, along with John Sutter 
in developing the Tidewater Boating Center extension of the San Francisco Bay Trail in that area of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, shoreline. He also was a great supporter of preserving the beach in Alameda um, by uh, getting uh, his board members to uh, approve along with him a $5 million stipend to uh, pump new sand into the beach as it had been eroding with the tidal fluctuations. And he was very committed to San Leandro Creek. Um, and um, I can't speak highly enough about Doug. I will end my portion and, and um, give it to, to um, Eric with the last statement that in his uh, 2014 um, oral history that we uh, had produced on behalf of the UC Berkeley um, Office of Government Institute of Governmental Studies. Um, the introduction was done by former general manager Robert Doyle, who ends his introduction by saying um, that Doug is a tireless and selfless in a way that is all too rare today. And the Park District and so many East Bay residents have had the benefit of that energetic vision for two decades. Uh, and that's the decades that he spent um, on our board. But for much more than that, uh, Doug has been um, uh, a beacon in the community um, of the East Bay. So now I will have Eric take over and talk about his legislative accomplishments. Thanks, thanks, Carol. Eric Feeler, Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs. And one of the joys about working with Doug um, was really his passion for advocacy um, and his very gentle way of pursuing that passion. So it's been a pleasure to have worked with him on a number of these issues. I know uh, some of you also know that firsthand. I know Irene, uh, the GSA property was, was a um, issue that uh, Doug really went to the mat for and we were successful um, actually uh, basically, basically winning over the, the federal government. Uh, then uh, on the sand replacement that Carol re referenced, we actually had to work really hard to get the funding from FEMA. Uh, he was very instrumental in that. And we already, already mentioned the Alameda point. One, uh, this is slightly worded, not quite right, um, and I apologize for that, uh, but the Bill Lockyer uh, Bridge is actually what Doug had named. Um, it's a bridge between the Oakland Airport and San Leandro, uh, so he played an instrumental role in that. And again, through his advocacy with the Special Districts Association, I know Roland would, will remember this well, how, how many years he was uh, the chair of the Alameda County chapter of CSDA, uh, and how 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 uh, consistent he was about going up for their Sacramento days every year and, and participating. Um, next slide, please. And then the other joy that I I personally had of working with with Doug was the fund our funding measures, um, both Measure CC and WW. I was actually working with the campaign consultant for Measure CC, and Doug was the campaign chair uh, and. The, the man can could definitely run a campaign meeting. Uh, he, was, he was very much missed when we went through uh, Measure FF. Uh, and then all, that, that measure was successful. It was the first uh, parcel tax that the district was able to, to successfully secure on the ballot with 68% of the vote. And as I mentioned, FF uh, extended it another 20 years just in 2018. Then Measure WW in 2008 was the largest, uh, $500 million was the largest park bond in the country, uh, we nominated, and you'll see in a later slide, Doug secured an award for that effort, and uh, it passed with 72% of the vote district-wide, which is not which is not an easy thing to do. So very proud of his, his work and leadership on that. Uh, next slide, please. And then just some other elements of his community service. I know, Michael, you, you'll know well his, his work with the San Leandro Creek Alliance. Uh, that's actually received some funding through the advocacy work that, that you all have done. Uh, he was also appointed by uh, Bruce Babbitt when he was interior secretary in the 90s to serve on the Point Reyes National Sea she Seashore Advisory Committee. Um, and then uh, just a host of uh, organizations that he belonged to and worked with. I at one point said to uh, our former general manager, Pat O'Brien, I see Doug everywhere. And he's like, we think there are two of them because he is everywhere at every community group. I think he was most proud of his work on the camp with the Camping Association, Christian Camping International and American Camping Association, um, but just a tireless advocate uh, for all things really. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then, as I mentioned, numerous awards, uh, very well-deserved and well-earned. Uh, I think uh, he was honored to, to receive the Special Districts Association Board Member of the Year twice. I'm not sure if that's actually occurred. We should, we should find that out. Um, and then the Camping Association Special Recognition Award was a, was a highlight for Doug as well. And I mentioned the 2008 um, award. And then you see the other joy that Doug had in his life was his family. Uh, is his family, uh, the, all the grandchildren and his four children uh, shown in the picture there. So with that, uh, next slide. Uh, with that, I think I would, if D, hopefully D is still here. I know he's got a, another meeting to jump to, but I'd like to maybe send it to D just for, to express the board's interest in the naming um, of the visitor center at Crab Cove uh, with, with keeping the visitor center at Crab Cove as part of the name, but just have Doug Seiden added to it. Um, so D, if you if you're available, could would you mind just saying a little bit about the board's interest in that? Sure, thank you very much. And um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm here uh, on behalf of uh, Ellen Corbett. Um, she uh, she passes on her regrets that she couldn't make this meeting, but um, I just wanted to uh, pass on from her and the, and the the feeling from the rest of the board of our board members is that. Uh, Doug Seiden was uh, so uh, involved and engaged in preserving uh, the shoreline in San Leandro and Alameda and, uh, and Oakland. And uh, it culminated in his collaboration with uh, Judge John Sutter and, and they were rightly named um, uh, like twins and we, we, they were called the, uh, the judge and the preacher. And uh, that advocacy work uh, has led to our, to the shorelines that we have today. And his work as, as a human being, uh, his, you can't, um, as, you, as you've seen in, as, as expressed here in the presentation, uh, is, above, is above scrutiny. I mean, he was just an incredible, incredible human being. And, um, uh, we feel that it's it's right to uh, to name to name uh, this facility uh, for his his contribution, his 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 um, his contribution as a human being, and his very very uh, uh, big involvement also in the Martin Luther King Freedom Center and uh, the education uh, for all the young people in the communities and communities especially of communities of color. And um, so I just wanted to pass that along. Uh, I know I worked with Doug when I was, uh, I was representing the uh, AFSCME 2428 on uh, all, those, all those bond measure committees that he, uh, he did rule, not with an iron hand, but with a soft glove. Um, and uh, he was able to direct uh, uh, an incredible, incredible campaigns uh, that were successful. And um, so I, that's, that's what I wanted to, to show that the, the, uh, the park district shows it's, um, it's, it's uh, honor. I mean, it's, it's honor and uh, I'm gonna say gratitude is the better word of, for his service and uh, what he's done for his community. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. Uh, Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about the naming policy, just how that fits here and what our thoughts are going forward? Well, um, just uh, I would just say that there is a um, provision in the naming policy uh, for the board to uh, name something uh, that they feel appropriate. Uh, normally, there would be a more extended public input process, uh, but when the board feels strongly about naming, they do have the authority to, to do that. Great, okay. And so this, this is actually an item that is being brought to us as information uh, since the board basically has decided to move forward on it. But uh, certainly if, if folks have questions or comments, uh, that, I think that's appropriate or if you and, and Carol are available to respond to those. 
Uh, let's see, Michael. You're, you're muted. Um, Carol, thank you very much for, and Eric, for, for showing just the surface of a, an incredible human. Um, I wish I was going to say this. I was wishing this could be an action item, and I'd, I'd like to make a motion for the pack to uh, push it through the to the board for immediate action. Um, if you ever spent time with Doug Seiden, you'll know he had uh, he, he's an old pole, P O L. Uh, you felt welcome. You felt respected. Uh, he had an incredible depth of humility that he brought to politics that I've never seen ever before. Hope to see more of it. Uh, charismatic leader. Uh, when he would sit you down in his office at Denny's and at Hagenberger, uh, you were kind of trapped there on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, you, you walked away wanting to do whatever the heck he was proposing. So it was just an extraordinary uh, experience to, to work with someone like this. And I only got to work with him in his uh, last 10 years when he was uh, as a trustee. But uh, yes, I would urge uh, this group and the board to, to move post haste on this. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Michael. Irene. Hi, uh, I'm prepared to second that motion, um, <laughs> but I think it's important. Um, I would I would like to add too that what made makes Doug so uh, special is that he always in our community in Alameda he would make uh, regular visits to our city council meetings to keep, uh, keep us abreast of what the park district was doing in our city. And so we always felt connected to what the regional park district was doing um, in our own community. And I, I thank him for that. And the other thing that uh, Doug um, should be noted for is he was the leader on the upgrade at uh, Breakwater Beach. As a matter of fact, he remains committed to the naming it Breakwater Beach because that was the name that the Navy gave it. And at uh, a few meetings, he requested that the uh, beach be named that. So um, I'm prepared to second it, but I'd also like to uh, suggest that there be a moratorium on naming other parks or places at parks um, until the uh, park district revisits its naming policy. And I think it's important that the PAC get to weigh in on that naming policy. We've had a few instances in the last year where we've been um, talking about names. So um, if I could add that friendly amendment to the motion, I would like to, to do that, that we have a little moratorium on naming any future areas. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's, let me hear from the other commenters here and then let's discuss uh, how to get that to the board, uh, Annie. All right, thank you, Chair Rickard. And uh, thank you also, Carol and Eric, uh, and for everyone, to everyone who helped uh, bring this to us today. Um, I didn't know him, so I can't speak to the individual, but I, I wanna second uh, what Irene just said in that um, one of the most uh, profound experiences I've had here on the PAC was the, uh, I think it was hours of comments we had about the naming of uh, the Thurgood Marshall Park um, and, and the real community input that was, was listened to. And I feel um, like there's a real opportunity for the district to upgrade, to re revisit its naming policy to match who the district is now in 2021 and beyond regarding equity and inclusion in terms of process and in terms of criteria. Um, and I think also there's a real opportunity um, for the district to learn from others around the region and perhaps around the state 
um, about how other districts, how other um, organizations, park agencies uh, name their parks, not just parks, but uh, to someone's point, also um, visitor centers and things within parks. Um, and as a, as a member of Together Bay Area, the district could you know, tap into a lot of different uh, organizations here in the region to learn from and, and share and um, perhaps influence others as well. Now, perhaps the, the district can, can uh, uh, revise its naming policies and inspire others to do similarly um, so that we're, we're naming parks and naming places in a much more equitable and inclusive way. So that's my, my hope. And I personally would be interested in being a part of that uh, process if, if one were to be established. Thank you. Great, thank you, Annie. Uh, Rochelle. Yeah, I'm uh, in agreement with the comments of Irene and Annie. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I don't know Doug. He does sound like an absolutely spectacular, amazing contributing person. Um, and uh, 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 definitely uh, worthy of, of uh, significant honor. Um, but in general, I think that it can be very problematic to name things after living people. Um, it can be, you know, these are enormously valuable privileges that, uh, and that was one of the reasons I asked about the, uh, the naming opportunities for philanthropists at the Tilden uh, facility. People are, you know, willing to make enormous donations uh, sometimes to, to have their name attached to something. Uh, so there's actually sort of a, there's a financial value and there's a political issue with, you know, someone having something named after them and then they're, they're out endorsing, you know, people for office and that kind of thing. It can, it can create the appearance of corruption, uh, which is, is, is troubling. And we've actually, you know, had concerns about that in, uh, in our area. Um, it also, the, it also seems like it's becoming routine to name something after long serving uh, members, preferably while they are living. And we've had Judge Sutter and um, Mr. Radke and Ms. Severin, and you know, there's, there's a long uh, history of this now, and I'm concerned about it becoming an expectation for long serving board members that, you know, that this is sort of like part of the compensation package for serving on the board. Uh, and that can have some negative impacts as well. One of the issues with, uh, well, I, I won't keep going. I just see a whole raft of problems with this. And I, I support this because it is the custom, uh, clearly. And clearly, Mr. Seiden is very well uh, qualified to, to follow, to be allowed to follow this custom. Uh, but I think that uh, declaring a moratorium following this one and rethinking this policy uh, is really something that, that ought to be done. Um, and, and it's gonna be tough taking that to the board, you know, that this is one of the reasons not to do this for living people is not to create conflicts of interest. So I hope it will be taken up and, uh, and re re really seriously thought through. Thanks. Thank you. Roland. Uh, thank you, Rick. Um, so this is a very interesting discussion. I have had the chance, as Eric has spoken, I have had a chance to work with um, Doug. I've known Doug probably more than 20 years now. Um, I came to the, um, uh, when I was on the Park Advisory Committee, he was very welcoming me to the committee. Uh, he's uh, one of the Alameda County uh, Special Districts Association. He basically mentored me in terms of, um, uh, I've been the president now for the last six years and vice president before that and, and, been, and been very involved. And so I, I, think, I think the words that maybe Rochelle said was a spectacular human being. I think that is a, a very appropriate term for Doug. Um, I, I, 
I think everyone has already spoken to the things that I was a little concerned about as well. Um, uh, I know that uh, when I was on the Park Advisory Committee between 2003 and 2010, we went over the naming policy as well at that, at that point too. I certainly would have appreciated perhaps having the naming policy uh, be a part of this packet so we could understand it. And, and uh, I, I think whatever the criteria is, Doug would, would probably fit really, real nicely in it, ex it, with the exception of if you have to be alive or not. Um, but I think, you know, uh, I think there's always a good time to name uh, a, a something after someone who's worthy of that naming. I'm a little troubled by the notion that we would, you know, recommend that the board move forward with this and at the same time be, be challenged by the notion of the naming. If we're challenged by the notion of the naming, then we should be challenged by the notion of the naming. And I think Doug would be fine, you know, well, I, well, I like I said, I think Doug would, would meet the criteria. So I, I, my only friendly amendment is, uh, there's always that, well, let's put this person in and then we'll do it. I think that kind of taints Doug's record. And Doug would probably say, fix, if you need to fix the policy, fix it. And I would be happy with that. Um, and, then, and then he would be able to uh, be able to be part of that. Uh, so I don't, I don't see any urgency to, to this in my mind, but that, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Roland. Um, I, I think, and I, I would let the board speak for themselves. I, my sense is the board felt there was some urgency to this, but I think I'm also hearing from the part, from the PAC members, uh, a, a strong consensus that we should go back to the board and ask them to clarify with our input, uh, their naming policy going forward, including uh, perhaps a moratorium on that. Uh, I don't, uh, Eric, do you have comments or perhaps uh, D, you might have comments as well, but uh, there's obviously a, a, some feedback coming to the board in regard to the naming policy. Since this is a um, informational item, I think what in, in other staff in the board may have uh, comments on it too, but I think we can reflect this discussion in the board material uh, when um, they consider the naming. Um, so I think we can have the, the, the comments by the PAC members reflected in that, in that board material and uh, hope that it's considered at that point, um, but perhaps other staff or Dee and Elizabeth themselves might have comments. I just wanted to say, yeah, the, poli the policy, um, uh, the naming policy is definitely on, on our radar and, and it's supposed to be brought before uh, the executive committee probably in November. Um, and, uh, and regarding the, uh, the, the naming of someone still alive, we had the experience of uh, naming Judge John Sutter Regional Shoreline just before uh, Judge John Sutter passed away. And I think we saw there the, um, number one, uh, I think Judge John Sutter was very, very surprised. And number two is that he and his family got to celebrate together. And uh, we, there was such a sense of gratitude and um, I, kind of, I think on the, and I think more for his family because it was a sense of accomplishment. He took it in stride that, you know, that's what I do. But for his family, it was, it was awe-inspiring because, you know, it's just dad, right? And, uh, and we see that here with uh, uh, Director Seiden and he is, his health, his health is, is failing. And we had a, uh, Director Corbett and I had a discussion with him um, uh, at, uh, at Judge John Sutter's uh, memorial. And, um, and we both felt very strongly that uh, at that time that uh, he was due, uh, 
he was do something, uh, a naming of something. And so, uh, the, and this is where we came, uh, came about naming. We wanted to, we wanted to name something for him before he passed away. Uh, and it, it's like I said, his health is failing, and uh, I. I I, I just think it's not just not just for him, but for his family, and to be able to see that uh, that honor uh, before he passes. But we uh, we are our our, our uh, naming policy is definitely going to come before the executive committee. Uh, we definitely want to uh, to embrace the uh, uh, the conversation uh, that came out of Thurgood Marshall uh, Regional Park, and um, we. Uh, we hope to embrace that as well. So uh, that hasn't. We are all we're all cognizant of that, and uh, we we want to we want to uh, continue that discussion and uh, bring all that forward. So, but in this one, it's all it's pure sentiment. <clears throat> and uh, for those of us that have have worked with Doug, I think uh, uh, it's well deserved. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thank you, Dee. Uh, I I think that. Since it is an information item, we, we're not really in a position to make a recommendation to the board. However, I would ask that the minutes, uh, including the comments that were made both uh, in regard to uh, Doug's history, as well as the overall naming policy be included, uh, those minutes be provided to the executive committee and ask that the executive committee uh, solicit input from the PAC at the time that they uh, move ahead on the naming uh, in November. Does that, does that sound reasonable to members of the group, Irene, others that have suggested that? Does that sound like a good approach? Right, and in the meantime, maybe take a moratorium until, until uh, the board actually revisits the naming policy. Um, mm -hmm and the PAC weighs in on it, that there's a moratorium on any further naming. Okay, we will ask that our minutes reflect that and that that be provided to the executive committee. Should we, should we vote on that? So just uh, about the, the moratorium? Uh, we, Request? yeah, well, I mean, we can take the, I'm confused on what the motion is at this point. I don't think the motion needs to include the naming for Doug since that's essentially already moving forward. But uh, if we could have the motion be for a moratorium uh, and reconsideration of the naming policy, is that what we're looking for? Correct. Okay. A moratorium on on any of naming of any further parks or park district areas until after the naming policy has been revisited the pack weighs in on it and then the board decides okay do i hear a second i'm just a question i'm trying to understand how can you um, take a, a vote on something that's not on the agenda Yeah, I, I think, um, Rick, I think the, the in November, there's a, at the exec committee, there is a review of uh, overall board operating guidelines, I believe. Um, Dee, please correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the naming uh, for the, uh, the visitor center, that is likely to go before the full board prior to the November executive committee. So there's there's two pieces to it. I think that the board material for the consideration of the site, site naming should reflect all the comments that have been spoken here. Uh, I don't, I, I agree with, um, with Yolanda. I don't think um, a, a vote would, would actually really be warranted. Um, but I think, I think we, I think we're, I think we're hearing the comments loud and clear and can, and can definitely articulate them to the, to the full board. Oh, okay. Roland. Is it, I think what we're, what we're trying to do is to to articulate that the the PAC has a consensus around what what I think Irene was saying is it, and is there some way to express that? Otherwise, it just comes over as my comments, Rochelle's comments, yeah. Irene's comments. But I think there, but I do think there was some consensus by the 
committee and how does that get our how does that get expressed to the board that consensus will be taken up because it will be reflected in the minutes and from my understanding what's next is that it's going to go to the executive committee and i believe those minutes will some kind of way be incorporated into that um, packet so uh, something i don't know exactly who's going to do that but it will certainly be in the minutes and, and actually, Yolanda, I think it goes to the, we'll, we'll be going to the full board next. I don't, I don't think it's going to executive. It's committee. not going to exec. Okay. okay. I have a question uh, and that uh, is what would be, what is the timing that we would be looking at in terms of the boards developing a, a formal naming policy? Mm, that I couldn't sure. tell you. Sure, Richard, I, can, yeah. I can take that one. Um, Christina Kelchner, AB, uh, AGM of Acquisition Stewardship and Development, and Brian Holt, Chief of Planning. He and I will be leading the effort on revising that naming policy and bringing that to the board. Um, and uh, it will take some time. We can be prepared to come in November to the board executive committee for probably an informational discussion that would include a survey of what other agencies are doing, sort of what are some best practices, what are some of the factors, um, and uh, give the board an opportunity and the public meeting to have some discussion of that. But then we would come to the PAC and do the, a similar thing to get input. And you know, just depending how much interest and discussion there is, it, it could take, it would certainly be into next year um, until we would be ready to have a new policy so we could have you know, full input. So I think we would want to be able, we would want to request that it be placed on the PAC agenda as early as possible so that we could provide our input. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Deb, I see your hand. I will get to you as quickly as I can here. Um, I think I'm in agreement that we can't really do a formal motion since it's not on our agenda, uh, but hopefully our uh, comments and concerns will be provided to the board. Uh, and now that Christina and uh, Brian have heard this, uh, that the PAC will be included as part of our work plan as the naming process goes forward. And I think that's probably the best we can ask for at this point. Uh, Deb, you had a comment? I think it's been covered. I'll just save time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, we will move on. Uh, Kevin, are you prepared to talk about the digital learning update? I am, yes. It is uh, always a pleasure to follow anything after uh, Director Seiden. So. Um, so if you give me just a moment, I will bring up my, uh, my short PowerPoint, but uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with all of you today. Okay. Uh, my name is Kevin Damstra. I am the supervising naturalist for uh, Black Diamond Mines out here at East Bay Regional Park District. Uh, at this point in time, my PowerPoint should be up. If not, please let me know. Um, but I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about digital learning and digital learning for East Bay Regional Park District started uh, before the pandemic, but really took off during the pandemic. And today, when we think about it, we have started to think about it as part of the larger program suite that we use as uh, interpreters. So before the pandemic, most of what we did as far as service numbers, as far as types of programs fell into the in-person programming uh, for the public and then in-person programming for field trips. But we always did have a little bit of components that fell into the digital learning realm. Uh, things like uh, creating packets for teachers that could be given out uh, for curriculum programs. Uh, videos, working with our public affairs department to create videos uh, was something that we've done for many years. And then with the creation of the second mobile visitor center, we started leaning into this a little bit more. And we started leaning in, into newer versions of digital learning, uh, specifically 
uh, through the realm of virtual reality and augmented reality that were connected to this vehicle. When the pandemic hit, all of the public programs that we did, all of the in-person programs that we did, they all came to a close. And this is something that by this point in time is it's kind of a well-known story. Um, but what not everyone has seen is the work that happened in the background. When we started to, to transition to all digital learning programming, it was really in 2019, um, excuse me, well, predominantly in 2020. Uh, in 2019, looking at those early virtual reality programs through Mobile Visitor Center, we served just over 16,000 people. In 2020, when we expanded our digital learning footprint to be much more online, to involve uh, pre-recorded videos, posted up on social media, um, that those numbers increased tremendously to over 86, uh, 860,000 people that we served. And this year alone, by the end of August, we've served over a million people through digital learning. All of this that goes on, it takes a lot of work. Uh, and nowadays it needs to be balanced with also doing all of the in-person programming. So while these virtual programs are still happening and all the pre-recorded programs are happening and the virtual field trips, because many classes still don't feel comfortable coming out to the parks, we're also back to running our visitor centers and running our, our weekday hikes or weekend hikes uh, and doing the things that we've been known for doing for many, many years. In addition to that, our staff has learned an entirely new skill set, uh, learning how to put programs together, learning how, <laughs> learning how cameras work and how video editing happens. Um, some of us have learned an awful lot about live streaming that we never knew we needed to know for our jobs. Um, some of our offices and facilities have been turned into really miniature studios. And with all of this, our staff ha has embraced this and our naturalists and our recreation staff have taken to finding new ways to connect with the public and really starting to revamp a number of different programs that we've done. This particular one is from the Tilden Fungus Fair. For many years, um, one of our naturalists, Trent Pierce, has run this, this fair in person. During 2020, he wasn't able to lead it in person. If you've ever had the, the pleasure to go to this fair at the Tilden Nature area, it is jam-packed with people in person. Obviously, during COVID, we didn't want to do that. Uh, he more than tripled the number of people that he served when they turned this into a virtual program partnered with our recreation department with Morgan Evans actually doing a cooking demonstration. All of it was able to be live streamed across multiple platforms. We've also been able to strengthen our partnerships with our stewardship department, being able to highlight some of the different research projects that they have going on throughout the parks, both by having virtual public programs, but also by sending our naturalists out with cameras, being able to film and take photos of the work that they do to highlight the work that many people don't see behind the scenes, but really some of the, the absolutely necessary work that has, has to happen to keep our parks, well, open, safe, and able to survive for future generations. One of the things that I'm most proud of uh, here at, at Black Diamond Mines and really across the district is that in the realm of digital learning, it has given us the opportunity to take the time to look for stories that as an agency, we have not typically highlighted. Uh, the staff here at Black Diamond Mines is also the staff that, that's responsible for the interpretation of Thurgood Marshall Regional Park, home of the Port of Chicago 50. Uh, this video here is the first of a series of videos and live programs and virtual programs that we put together this year to highlight that park, to highlight the stories connected to it, and really be able to showcase some of these stories that, that we have not been telling um, and that as an agency we have not been uh, amplifying. We're starting to do more of that and through digital learning we're, we're starting to see a large expansion of, of that reach. Another example of that would be some of the programs we did here about the Chinese uh, immigrants that 
were here in Antioch and at Black Diamond Mines, uh, but have not had their story told as strongly as some of the others. Um, and we're starting to do more and more research about that. Even just yesterday, we had a new article that was discovered uh, about the Chinese here at the town of Summersville, what is now Black Diamond Mines. Along with all of these, all of these different stories, the virtual programs, the field trips, we're starting to look more towards what is the next way of connecting and how do we make this more impactful? And I mentioned at the beginning that some of this had started with the, the second mobile visitor center and the virtual reality and the augmented reality programming. Uh, we are in the process right now of creating an augmented reality app. We have two versions of it that are currently available for download. Uh, the East Bay Parks virtual tour was the very first one that, that the company that we worked with made. Uh, the Ardenwood one is, is a slightly newer version, but these allow us to be able to showcase the parks through people's mobile devices in a different way. The new technology also allows us to be able to actually showcase artifacts and um, 3D objects that people normally wouldn't be able to see. Uh, that also, that technology was also used in our, our new virtual reality visitor center I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, for this app, one of the things that's happening here at Black Diamond Mines is we're in the process of recreating the historic town of Summersville. And the company that we worked with actually took our historic photos and has rebuilt these computer generated models of what the town looked like. So people will actually be able to move through the town to see things like the old hotel um, Sam Brown's general store, uh, and one of the saloons. The efforts that we, we started doing with the virtual reality has continued and during the pandemic, it culminated with uh, what is now referred to as the virtual reality visitor center. Uh, this visitor center is hosted through Oculus uh, onto the, the Oculus headsets. Uh, it will be launching very soon. The last thing that we are waiting to do is to actually recreate the portion of that experience that has to do with Thurgood Marshall so that it no longer is referred to as Concord Hills, but has the accurate name. Uh, have a video that hopefully should work to show you what the Virtual Reality Visitor Center looks like. Uh, if we went through the entire thing, it does take about 45 minutes, so I shortened it down to just one minute. When you go into this visitor center, we have three different rooms that you can go into, one for exploring the parks, another one for the indigenous peoples of, of the East Bay. Uh, this is an area that does have some of those 3D objects that were scanned so that you can actually look at them and they do have voiceovers where naturalists are explaining what's going on. And then from the top of Mission Peak, we created an experience to focus on climate change that actually can go, you can go back in time or forward into the future. Going back in time, you see what it looked like before European contact. Uh, and there were multiple points discussing what it looked like and what the area was like and how human change, human impacts changed the area. Going forward, we use climate modeling both along the shoreline and then also for the inland portions to discuss how uh, it's expected that the Bay Area may change. We also have points that highlight some of the things that we can do to try as a park agency and as communities to try to forestall some of these changes from occurring for climate change. Um, one of the greatest powers that we have with digital learning is that these different tools from social media to live streaming to um, the virtual reality and the augmented reality, they all support one another. So as we create something in one area, it allows us to use it as a tool in a different area. And we can post in different areas and we can, uh, can highlight what we're doing in a much more powerful way than with just the 20 or 30 people that might be with us on a particular hike. The greatest benefit that we have right now is being able to balance both the digital learning and the in-person programming. In-person programming allows us to, to have a much more personal connection with people, but the digital learning allows us to have more connections with them and to impact and connect and connect with people in multiple different ways. Um, 
I realize that it's a, a very quick overview of an awful lot of work that we've been doing, and I'm happy to answer any questions that people have uh, about digital learning or about where the interpretive department is right now. Thank you, Kevin. Got questions for Kevin and digital learning. Susie. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I <clears throat> have taken advantage of some of that as a docent. Uh, they were able to do docent programs for us uh, over you know, 2020 and 2021. And also, um, <laughs> I wish I'd known about some of these programs I would have signed up for them. So thank you so much for giving us a, a broad, you know, I know you said it's a snapshot of everything you've been doing, but you've, you've shown us a lot. I've, I've been taking the uh, naturalist journaling class, <laughs> not, not being very good at drawing, but learning. Thank you so much. Thank you. That, that particular one, um, when Erica first started doing those, she and I had a conversation about how not everyone has had successful nature journaling programs. And, in a digital world, she proved me extremely wrong. Uh, she has run those for hundreds of people from around the world. Great. Roland, do you have a question? Uh, great presentation, um, Kevin, and I'm really excited to see what is going to ultimately happen with this program and the, the virtual and augmented learning. My question is around what is the what is the driver? What is the what is the intended outcome? Uh, is it is it for people who are already engaged and for them to have a deeper understanding of the parks and and its history, which I think are fabulous? Or is this an opportunity to um, introduce the parks to people who might not otherwise come? And then the outcome, you know, what what do you be looking for as a result is more uh, usership of the parks by folks who hadn't used the park in the past. Thank you for the, for that question. Um, the virtual and augmented reality portion of this uh, has been run through a regional parks foundation funded program known as parks to people. And that program in particular was designed to try to create access points and being able to showcase the parks to people who, who were not able to get to the parks for a variety of reasons. Um, being able to, to make stronger connections to those parks, even if they aren't present. Uh, one of the side benefits to that could be to increase uh, visitation to the parks, um, but it wasn't a, a primary goal for a lot of this. When we shifted over into all field trips, all public programs, and everything being digital learning, I think a lot of us had the hope that that um, when we first started, it's like, oh, it'll keep everyone connected and maybe more people will come back. And, and what we found during the pandemic that was that um, people came to the parks regardless of whether they saw a video, um, but that people felt more connected and have gotten more information about how to interact with the parks and how to connect with the parks that they are coming to uh, through a lot of these programs. So to, to answer your question, I, it's a, a little bit of both. Um, it has a tremendous impact to connect with people that will never be able to get to our parks or will very rarely be able to. Um, my kids have a very strong connection to the USS Constitution in Boston because we've been watching virtual live tours for a year and a half on it. Someday we're going to have to go on a trip there. Um, <laughs> we at Black Diamond have seen a lot of connections to people whose descendants lived out here, uh, but are now outside of California that are connecting back. So, did that answer your question? It did. It did. And I and I, you know, I think the Park District I, and some of the presentations they've made in the past, I think, have done a really good job of articulating. Um, what what was the intended outcome, and then what's the what's the data that supports that? So hopefully there is. It, it sounds like maybe right now that's not as well defined, and I would just offer that perhaps you do so that if you come back in a year or two, you can say this was the reach or this you know 
give us the the the, the there there of of what happened. Certainly. Great. Okay. Neil, you have a question. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That was uh, really great. Um, I just want to say that, uh, you know, I really love this type of thing. I teach college age students and, um, you know, this is how people of that age interact with the world these days. And, you know, there, there's a little bit of a downside there. It makes me, you know, sad that, uh, you know, in some cases they may be choosing the digital experience over the sort of analog hands-on experience. Um, and so my big hope for this is that it does sort of the follow up um, on what Roland was saying is that it serves as a conduit for especially younger people, you know, to tantalize them and bring them out into the real world. And, and hopefully a lot of the programming that you're developing, you know, has that as sort of one of the intended outcomes. Thank you. Great. Adela. Yeah, I, I just have to say that my reaction was, wow, that's amazing. A million people that you're reaching. That's fabulous. Um, also, I just wanted to say that that's really a great benefit also to staff in terms of expanding their skills in, you know, this new, more digital world. And um, then I had a question, which is, is any of this being done in other languages or planned to be in other languages at some point? For the digital learning, we do have uh, a series of Spanish language videos. Um, they are not as extensive as our English language videos, but we do have some. Uh, we also are uh, looking into trying to get a, number, a certain number of our videos this year create, uh, recreated for um, pause points and audio description that, that would be able to be posted up onto our, our website. Uh, as for the augmented reality app, uh, there is functionality built into that app that at the very beginning, people would be able to choose a language to be able to interact with it in. Excellent, thank you. Great. Marie. Thank you, Kevin, that was a great presentation. Um, I've been going to Black Devon Mine since I was a kid. And so to see the town of Somersville to actually be brought to life, if you will, um, gets me really excited. Um, I went there with my family and tried to explain, uh, you know, parts of the park that uh, I remember growing up on uh, with the naturalists of the time. And so I really look at this as something that we can use as a supplement in addition to being there in person. Um, so I uh, thank you so much for, for what you're doing and, and extending the reach um, of the parks department. Thank you. Great. Carlin. Thank you. You know, I just want to add my kudos to this. Um, and, you know, it's so timely too, given uh, what the city of Antioch is doing to highlight, you know, the, the reparations for the Chinese community that they're engaged in. And so I just, I'm, I'm really excited about this. And I think, you know, God forbid we have another pandemic or another situation that causes us to, you know, have to be more virtual in the future. I think it's good that this is being, um, that this has all been developed now. So, um, and I think it also helps with an accessibility issue because not everybody can get out to Antioch to enjoy this beautiful park, um, but they can learn about it and, um, and maybe visit Antioch can utilize this as a way to, um, to, to uh, encourage people from all over the Bay Area and the country to, to come visit their fair city as well. So um, I think there's a lot of really positive things coming out of this and, and I just wanna applaud you for doing this. Thank you. Great. All right, well, thank you, Kevin. That was very interesting. We're all looking forward to great things over the next year or two when you come back with uh, even more. <laughs> great. All Thank right. You. Well, we'll move on to our last agenda item, which I guess belongs to me and Eric. Uh, so in your packet that you receive uh, is an item called Appendix C. It is Appendix C to the Board Operating Guidelines, and it relates specifically to the mission and operating guidelines for the Park Advisory Committee. Uh, that document has been in effect 
I, I believe there were some minor changes made in 2019, but basically it's been in effect for 10 to 15 years. So over the last year, uh, your Park Advisory Committee Executive Committee has uh, gone over the document and has proposed the changes that you see in the packet that you received. And so I want to thank Adela, Annie, Carlin, and Roland for their work on putting that together. Uh, I want, let me briefly, uh, well, Eric, do you want to say anything before I go into the details of this? Um, I, uh, all I really would add is just that this was a recommendation by the board um, to have the PAC look internally first and then report back um, to, to the board via the exec committee um, once the recommendation, uh, once the PAC has recommendations. I also will say, I think, I think this was on our work plan for 2020 and because of everything that happened that year, uh, it got moved over to this year. So um, glad we're moving it forward. Yes, yes, at last we are moving it forward. Uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to be able to do tonight is to take the recommendations that the executive committee of the PAC has made uh, and forward those to the executive committee of the board for inclusion in the uh, board operating guidelines as they work to revise those. Uh, there, there's a lot of markings in there and it probably is a little confusing, but let me just say that most of the changes that are shown in that document are wordsmithing or they're intended to provide clarification or in some cases, bring the guidelines into conformance with the actual practices that we have developed within the PAC. And so uh, I'm sure we could go into great detail on whether we wordsmithed it exactly right and so forth, but I think we got it pretty close to what we actually do and what we want, what we think the PAC should be doing for the board. The, the most significant change that is proposed relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, since that has been an important uh, part of our work for the last year or so and, and going forward. In looking at how to bring diversity to the PAC, we did basically two things in this operating guideline. We included a paragraph or added a paragraph to the document that you'll see that encourages board members to strive for inclusivity in their nominations to the PAC. And that's obviously important as they go forward. We also recognized, however, that the turnover on this group is very slow because we tend to stay on for long periods of time. And so we felt that we needed a way to bring diversity into the group faster than waiting for people's terms to expire and be renominated. A proposal was brought to us by Mona Co that we felt made a lot of sense. And so we've incorporated it into our proposal. And that is that we recommend increasing the size of the Park Advisory Committee from 21 to 23 members and that those two additional members be appointed by the existing multicultural advisory committee. So we'd be bringing two members of that committee into the PAC uh, in addition to the 21 people that we have. And that is the document that we're bringing forward tonight for hopefully a recommendation to forward to the executive committee to incorporate these changes as they modify the board operating guidelines. And do anybody else on the executive committee want to comment on that in terms of uh, what we did and where we're going with this? Irene, I see your hand, so go right ahead. Yes, I actually have uh, a few clarifying questions. Okay. I'm hoping that someone can answer. Um, let's see, uh, under the composition and nomination parks part, uh, 
There is a, a comment in uh, red at the top that says once appointed members may retain their appointment for the designated term without regard to changes of the ward boundaries. Question I have is about or change in residence. I don't know, does that actually mean that um, if a board member appoints someone in their ward, but then that someone moves to a different area uh, outside their ward that they can remain on the pack under them? Yes, that's what it means. Okay. It, it's, the, the, I, I, I don't have that wording right in front of me, but yes, the wording is that you, you're appointed for a two year term and you would remain on the PAC for the remainder of that two year term, uh, even if you moved out of the area of the ward. It would then obviously be up to the uh, board member as far as renominating you at that point, given that you had moved out of the uh, area. I see, so, so you don't have to actually live in the ward for the second time. I can see fulfilling the rest of your term, but for the, the duration, you could be technically on uh, serve as a PAC member and not even be in your ward for a decade. No, no, for the remainder of the two year term. But you said the board member can still renominate you even if you moved. Right? Anyway, it's not clear. So I just think that's something that needs to be, um, that needs to be clear uh, in this. Okay. If it was a question for me. Okay, that's okay. a good question. I, I will look and see if I can, I, I thought it was clear to me, but now, now that you ask it, I need to look back and see. Uh, okay. James, you have a question? I, I still have two more oh, clarifying. Oh, two more. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. And you don't have to answer. You can answer them together or wait and answer it. I don't care. Okay. But under C, under PAC officers, there's something that seems to be missing for me that's not in there is, is who nominates the PAC officers or how do you run, you know, if you're interested. And that's not in there. So me as a PAC member, um, if I actually wanted to serve as chair or vice chair, I don't know uh, how I can be active in doing that. Um, because I don't honestly, not that I want the position, mind you, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I think that there's nothing in there that says um, how, how a person is nominated to fill that role. Okay. Okay, and then my last clarifying question is under the goals, objectives, and assignments. Okay. There, there are states a part that says there's a referral for the board members to seek advice from the PAC. But is there a mechanism for the PAC to make a recommendation to the board so that it's more of a back and forth versus always coming from them? Um, and if not, is that something that we can um, suggest that they consider? So th those are my three clarifying questions. Um, your first point is as far as no nomination of officers, I believe you're correct that we don't have the process in there. We need to uh, address that. There is a, I'm trying to find it now, the, um, it, it, your, your, your uh, Roland, go ahead. Yeah. Could, could, I, could I speak to the first question as how I read that and how I always understood it is the, the, directors, appointees, and I think it even says it uh, in there, it says they should be from the, the ward, uh, but I think that's up to the director to decide. They, they, get, they get to pick their members. 
So it says, uh, nom okay, here it is. Uh, uh, above where, what we added, it says nominated individuals should be residents of the area representing the, the nominating authority. Ah, uh, okay. I, that, I, that seems to be a permissive statement to me. As mm -hmm. a, uh, so um, I took that to mean that, that they could um, nominate someone that's outside of their specific area if they thought they might be um, beneficial to the PAC. Okay. No, I'm glad you caught that wording. And I think that is, that makes sense. Um, Irene, the, the last question you asked. The last question had to do, is there a mechanism for the PAC to make a recommendation to the board on our own? So everything doesn't have to originate at the board level that we can actually be a proactive group if there is an issue that we think is that the board hasn't really considered that's a major issue in the park district that right. we think that, that they should consider looking at. Yes, there is, and but I'm not sure it's worded exactly like that. Uh, under the PAC recommendation, well, okay, Recommendations to the board will be transmitted via approved minutes from the meeting uh, so that we do make recommendations through our minutes. Uh, that is one way. And the, the Park Advisory Committee makes an annual report of its activities to the Board of Directors. Um, but we also say as needed, the chair or designee shall report information regarding the PAC and its activities to the board. That would seem to me to open up, to, to allow the, the PAC chair to go to the executive committee or the board and, and make a report, which would include a recommendation. So just clarify this for me, how that would look. Supposing me as a PAC member, I want to, I think that the park district should look at its naming policy, but it's not on anybody's radar. Okay. Okay. And I come to the pack and I can say it under my own personal comment, which would be in the minutes, but the pack itself is a full body. Maybe I want to ask the entire pack. Do you, is there a majority of you who thinks that the board should look at the naming policy. You know, mm -hmm. if I attached the reasons why I think, you know, if there was some sort of, you know, paper trail or something, is there a way in which the full pack can, can vote and decide that we think something is so important that they should consider looking at it? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a good, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go, go right ahead. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. In the in the mission statement, the last the last sentence there there says the PAC may also initiate projects with approval of the board. So, I, I think Irene is right that really the way it's all written is that the board sets the direction for the PAC, but the PAC may also in effect, ask the board to take on certain projects that may not have been initiated by the board. Right. But, but I think Irene's point is that we, do we have the mechanism to, to do that? If it's not on our agenda right. to do it, how, how, do we, how do we add it to the agenda? And I'm not sure we're clear on that. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. got it. I, I just want to say that I know at a city level, how that works is like members of a board would submit something in writing to the chair um, with full details about a topic and the chair would agendize it to ask the full body right. whether or not they think it merits um, sending on uh, to um, you know, the city council, say yeah. you know, to the yeah. actual policymakers. Okay. 
yeah, I, I think you've raised an interesting point. I don't think we do address it quite adequately at this point. Uh, James. Thank you. Uh, and, and just to clarify on the previous speaker, basically what I'm hearing is that um, right now we do not have a process in which uh, a PAC member has the ability to put a, a, an item on the agenda for us to vote on. That's basically what I'm hearing from her, from, from, from y'all and from her. Is that basically what I'm getting? And I'm sorry for raising this question because now that she raised it, I wanted I wanted clarification. Okay. And it could be, a, I don't know, I'm just curious. Like, like under the current rules, there's no way for a PAC committee members to bring forward um, something in which they want the committee to vote on. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Uh, okay, okay, no, no worries. Uh, obviously, this is a the discussion to be had that will take a long time, so I don't want to go too much into it, but I certainly hope it will be agendized for the future. Uh, but I wanted to get back on the topic of um, what is uh, what is the really exciting, which is the fact that uh, our, our board, our PAC, uh, or our PAC who is recommending to the board and our board, is actually committed to um, equity uh, and diversity and inclusion, which I think is very, very important. And uh, I, I'm very in favor of this. Uh, and I'm just gonna uh, state a few things and I just wanna make sure I get a yes or no. Uh, obviously, our, as organizations, we are not allowed to select people based on race, age, gender, you know, et cetera. Um, I, I hope I'm correct in that. Please correct me if I'm incorrect. However, obviously the goal is to go through the equity and division, uh, equity and inclusion uh, committee. Uh, which obviously we would select members through there and, and, and obviously the qualified members who, who reflect that committee would be selected and that's how we're going to move forward with the process. Am I, am I correct in regards to that? Yeah, that those two members would be named by, by the MAC, yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, I, I just wanna say once again, how excited I am that this is happening. I'm, to I'm in total support. I'm actually gonna go ahead and motion the recommendation that is being made. Uh, I hope I'll get a seconder. Uh, for the discussion purposes. Uh, I'm assuming we're taking action. And then the final thing I will say is, I think it's really great that we wanna have more board members uh, who are uh, who, who don't look like uh, everybody, the majority of the people on this board. I myself, not just being an Asian person, but also being in my 30s, uh, who, who started to get involved with the parks when I was 29, would also like to see not just people of different uh, races, but also people of different uh, uh, gender uh, expression, gender identity, and also age. Uh, but obviously, I think the racial component is the most important. It should be centered as well. But I also just want to point out that uh, when we do have these new board members, especially people that, that might not look like us, um, that we create a welcoming space. Because the last thing we want is we want people to be tokenized. The last thing we want is for people to uh, be in a space in which it, it becomes a hostile space. Um, and, and this comes from personal experience as well. So um, I'm very, like I said, I'm very excited. I like the motion. Somebody please second my motion for the committee's recommendation. Uh, and then I, and, that, and those are my comments. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, James, can you clarify what your motion is? Your motion is approving the, the document as presented? Oops. Okay, I, I think, are you there, James, or we, have we lost you? Oh, sorry, I'm here. I didn't know why I was muted, but I'm here. Okay, can you clarify what your motion is? Give me, give me one moment. If somebody else has comments, please pick them. I'm trying to get the language out. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rochelle, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to express support for what um, uh, Irene Dieter uh, suggested with regard to um, having a mechanism for uh, the for members of the PAC to bring something to the PAC, and then if the PAC agrees that it's something that they want to take up, uh, to be able to take that through the executive committee to the board and get permission to take it up. We, we have a mechanism like that in my city. Um, and, you know, committees, members of committees come up with things that, that we never thought of. So they need to come forward. If the committee wants to do it, then it goes to the council. And if the council says, yeah, we'd like to see that uh, taken up, then we give direction. And I think that a, 
a mechanism like that would make a, a lot of sense for this body. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just Susie, Rick, Rick uh, just to, to speak yeah. to that for a second. Um, there is a mechanism. It just may not be as um, efficient as I think what Irene is suggesting and maybe Rochelle is seconding. Um, it, it, would, it would require um, the PAC to recommend for the chair to go back before the board exec executive committee to make a change in the work plan. So it is it is possible. And I think it's been I think it's happened once since I've been here, but it, it may not be the most efficient system that, that you guys would like to, you know, pursue. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Uh, Susie. I just wanted to say that um, I, I don't want to rush through this. Uh, um, you know, we've come to the time that we normally would end the meeting, but um, and I actually have something I need to go to and I don't want to miss any of it. Yeah. So I, I don't know if, how you feel, Rick and Eric, if, if we could spend a little more time on this before we vote. I, my personal feeling is that I think we do need to spend more time because I think Irene has brought up interesting. They're not, uh, it, it's not a terribly challenging thing. I think we can get into it and, and work out the wording and put it in there. But uh, I, I think that it probably makes sense <laughs> to uh, take it back and take a look at it um, with that feedback. Um, uh, Adela? Yeah, I just wanted to say that and especially since we're supposed to be representing the community, I think that, that that would be great to have that actually written into the guidelines. Okay. Uh, James, I see you're back with your hand up. Yes, uh, I, I, I did wanna make a recommendation, but it seems like if we can't piecemeal these recommendations, uh, it makes no sense for me to make a recommendation. Is that what I'm basically sensing from the board? I, I think what we're hearing is that we do we do need to go back and rework some of the uh, details. That I, I think there's agreement on the diversity, equity, and inclusion part, and this is more the internal workings of how we communicate with the board and, and make our priorities known. Is that yeah? Is and that and I actually, yeah, and I totally agree with my uh, other PAC members. Of we should definitely be able to present. Um, be explicitly be able to present items in front of our fellow committee members and then also be able to vote on them to express our views. So thank you for bringing that up. And okay. thank you, Chair. Okay. Any other comments? If not, we will uh, take this back and, and bring it forward again uh, with the uh, with addressing the, the issues of that, that Irene and Rochelle have brought up. Annie? Uh, Chair? Oh. Oh. Just real quick, Chair Rickard, just want to thank you for moving this forward. It's it's probably one of the more glamorous parts of your role. And um, <laughs> just want to acknowledge uh, that glamour and, and glitz and, and uh, shine hey, that you're, you get with this. So. All, about, all about glamour, yes. Thank you. But thank seriously, you. thank you for keeping moving it forward. Really appreciate yeah. it. Hey. James? Uh, and Chair, just, uh, just so... Um, I or hopefully other people would know um, if we have edits or suggestions in regards to specifically this item, um, th th this item, um, are we, uh, can we submit it directly to you or should we just get ready and be prepared for our next meeting to, to, to present options? Please, please send it to me. I, I'll share it with the rest of the executive committee and we can work on it from there. So yes, input from you directly would be great. Thank you. Okay. Ah, great. Uh, I believe we're getting close to the end of our meeting. Does anyone have any, any reports from committees that they have attended? I assume not, but if there are any, please let me know. Okay. Report from the chair, I've just a couple of things. I'm looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible on October 16th at Point Malate. It's gonna be a delicious barbecue and 
should be fun. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. Uh, an issue that is going to be coming forward in the future is the schedule and venue for our meetings in, in the, the next year. Uh, the board is still dealing with what the technology is for hybrid meetings of the board going forward. So that is not fully defined yet. But we're looking for input and hopefully over the next month or next month or so, we'll have more information on how we might uh, continue to do hybrid meetings uh, in the next year, even if we are able to meet again in person. Uh, the challenge is social distancing for the, a group this large within the boardroom, as well as how do you include people in Zoom uh, and particularly under the Brown Act and so forth, how what the interaction is. So there are a lot of things that need to be addressed, but hopefully in the next month or so, we'll be hearing from staff about how we might do that. Something I would ask people to think about is the meeting time. Uh, I think for many of us, the 4 p.m. meeting time has worked well. And if we have a hybrid meeting where you don't have a two hour commute to get here, Maybe it will continue to work, maybe not, but that's something just to think about over the next month or so as we try to figure out what the meeting schedule looks like in the upcoming year. Is there any other old business or new business? Uh, Igor, I see your hand. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Finally got unmuted. Uh, I would just like to point out that the uh, legislature and legislator, hmm, the ledge, <laughs> has been active and they've passed a bill uh, having to do with open meetings and remote meetings and all that kind of thing. And it's kind of in three steps. Uh, the first step is to allow us to continue as we are. And that, expand, uh, that permission expires in January. Uh, the second part is to uh, to uh, continue in a modified way where you don't have to show the uh, home address of every participant uh, for, a, for a couple of years. And then uh, if nothing else happens, that expires in a, in a few years. And then we had go back to the old Brown Act uh, restrictions which say that if you have a uh, meeting which people can you know, participate in it from offsite, you have to publicize every one of those places uh, so that the public can come there. Yeah. So that if uh, we did a meeting like we're doing right now, all of our addresses would have to be put out there on the announcement of the meeting and the public should be granted off access <laughs> to our particular uh, portals into the meeting. So that I would have, you know, people in my in, in my uh, spare bedroom here uh, participating in the meeting. Yeah, That's I the strict agree. interpretation of the Brown Act, which would uh, kick back in again uh, after the second sort of a hybrid. Uh, uh, yeah, not I, exactly I, giving us the freedom yeah. we have now, yeah. but still still allowing some some uh, off. Yeah, I, I think we still have a ways to go on that. I, I know Eric wants to comment, and I see that Yolanda just posted in the chat a link to the text of that so you can take a look at it. Yeah. Eric? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that we're, our legal counsel is looking into that, that bill to better understand how we, moving forward, how we function with our meetings. Yeah, we're very interested in that for my own particular district, the Resource Conservation District. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to find ways to do deal with that. And, and I, I'm really looking forward to getting some help with figuring this out. Yeah, that, that's why I just wanted to mention it tonight, but we will definitely be coming back in future meetings to talk about it. Yeah. Marie, you have your hand up. Yes, I will be really quick because I realize that we are um, out of time. The city of Antioch is partnering with Contra Costa Transportation Authority and Street Smarts Diablo to bring a bicycle garden to Antioch. Uh, the Bicycle Garden will teach um, families the techniques of biking, um, safe pedestrian interaction, um, 
as well as uh, bicycle, just general bicycle safety. Um, I'm going to drop a link to how to be a part of our uh, community workshop um, if anybody is interested in participating. Great, thank you. Any other? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Any other announcements from members? Uh, uh, I see Yolanda has something. I, to I know I'm not a member, but I just wanted to let the um, let the PAC know that the the uh, board is having a special meeting on uh, Wednesday, the 29th. And one of the items on this meeting is this AB 361, um, which is talking about going back into um, uh, virtual hybrid, all, all kinds of meetings. So we should have some um, answer um, by next week. All right. Great, thank you very much, Yolanda. Ah. I think that's it. I think we've reached the end of the meeting. And so uh, it, with that, we will adjourn and see hopefully all, most or all of you on the 16th and then again at our October meeting. With that, 